anymore. But I do work very closely with several mental health um, solicitors and we work collaboratively on cases of people in ATUs because of the crossovers that you get. Um, so it is really important to have those um, links as well. The second option um, is a bit more complicated option. It's judicial review. Um, this is the process by which the admin court can review decisions of public bodies to act or fail to act on behalf of individuals. So like I put there, it does include the government and the NHS because they are bodies that deliver a public service. Um, this must be used as a remedy of last resort. If there are other options, then those other options must be pursued first, which I think is really important actually and key to judicial review. Um, they can be complicated, um, they can be costly, and they can have strict, well, they do have strict rules around them, which you really need to be able to grapple with. They sometimes can be lengthy, and I think sometimes the expectations on clients is that it will instantly fix a problem. And I think from my experience, whilst they can be very helpful and can um, allow decisions to be retaken, they don't necessarily um, always go all the way in judicial review. And I think as solicitors, we have to be very careful in the way that we advise clients when we pursue this kind of option. Um, there's also a um, limited number of remedies which the court can consider. Um, I'll, I'll go through these briefly, just um, sort of touching upon each one. But more information on all of these things can be um, found online. There's some really good resources, actually. And if anybody needs any of those links or anything, then do just let me know and I can um, ping those on. So they can order, um, you can ask for a quashing order, um, which overturns or undoes the decision being challenged. This is the most common outcome of a successful judicial review. Um, and that's also not to say that every judicial review is successful. And so it does need to be considered kind of at each stage, what you're gonna do um, with that. You can also get a prohibiting order. So this stops a public body from taking an unlawful decision or an action which has not yet been taken if you know that they are going to do it. Um, you can also ask for a mandatory order where the court can direct a public body to take an active step. So, for example, they can take a new decision within a specified period of time. This is a more unusual thing that the court can order, but it is still within something that they can consider. They can also make a declaration. So they can make an order stating what the law is. Generally speaking, judges are reluctant to do this as they believe that what they write in their written judgment is adequate. So if you're asking for this, I think you need to be really specific on why you need to ask for this over and above um, considering the written judgment. You can also ask for a declaration of incompatibility. So that relates to when an act of parliament contravenes the, men the Human Rights Act. So it may well be that you want to invite the MPs to change the law to comply with the Human Rights Act. And that is something, again, that you could do. Um, damages also is something which you could seek, um, but only really if you are seeking another form of legal remedy. So this obviously makes it more complicated. Um, there are three circumstances, really, where you can ask for um, damages. So. So where either there's a right to damages under private law, but you would need the judicial review to establish. So, for example, to show that a period of detention was unlawful. Um, and then you would then on the, on the back of that be able to um, pursue the damages claim. Or secondly, where there has been a breach of human rights, which obviously is really important. of your rights under European Union law. Um, so those are three circumstances for damages generally. Um, the other option you could try and pursue is an injunction, um, which is a temporary order requiring a public body, so the NHS um, possibly, to, to do or not to do something until a final decision is made. And 
just to say all of these remedies are discretionary. So the court will make a decision based on the circumstances and what it considers to be appropriate and acts in a way which is fair and practical. And even before you make your application for judicial review, you may well put in, for example, five grounds which you want to rely on. The court can come back and say no to all five. It could say yes to a couple. And even and then it would then move on to the next step, of then considering the merits of those particular um, grounds. And then the defendant would have their opportunity to come back. And so you may well win on all your grounds you've managed to get through or win on none. It, it's very sort of um, difficult to predict with judicial review. And so really it is quite a complicated process to go for. And um, what I've done is I've just put a case study example of somebody who's in a mental health unit to really give an example of how I've used judicial review um, and been successful. So um, I've, um, I've obviously changed um, the name of my client um, and some of the circumstances, but just to give you a flavour, so Mr X has diagnoses of emotion stable personality disorder and he's also autistic. He's detained under the Mental Health Act, um, Section 3, and he appealed against his section. His tribunal was due to be heard at the end of January this year. Um, he was notified seven days um, before his tribunal that he was going to be moved. So it's on a Friday afternoon, he was notified he was going to be moved at 9 a.m. on um, the following Monday. He was going to be moved potentially to a unit um, 120 miles away from his current hospital and to a placement which was CQC rated as inadequate. Doesn't sound great. Um, so he contacted his mental health solicitor, um, who obviously listened to what he said, tried to contact the trust and the CCG to try and find out kind of what was going on and, and what the need was for it to be quite so urgent. Um, he heard nothing back. So he contacted myself, like I said, we work quite closely with mental health solicitors. And so what we did is we tried to contact them as well um, and got nothing as well. So we on the Saturday applied for legal aid, um, this being a means tested legal aid application, um, and then issued proceedings for injunctive relief. So this was an injunction to temporarily stop the move um, of Mr X on Monday morning um, to allow for his tribunal the following Friday to go ahead. Um, I made the application on the Sunday morning to the out of hours judge um, down in London. It got transferred up to the regional court and then back down to London and um, which was a bit of a bit of a carry on. Um, but the case was eventually heard on the Sunday evening at about 7.30. Um, the order that we sought to stop the move was granted at about maybe about 9 p.m. So then we then had to get that order straight across to the ward, straight across to um, the trust to stop the move on the Monday morning, um, which was great because that means it didn't happen. Um, the tribunal didn't actually go ahead fully um, in full on that next Friday because of some information which was outstanding. So it then eventually went ahead um, properly on um, at the end of September. And actually, he was successful in his um, first year tribunal and he was actually discharged from his section that day. So with that case, the grounds that we were really relying on were around the impact on the tribunal. So the date just being seven days um, you know, be before a move, clearly the um, medical staff in the next unit are not going to have an opportunity sufficient to get to know Mr X, they're not going to get to know all of his um, ins and outs and really kind of make that plan for, um, for a discharge. They're not going to know whether he's going to be willing to stay informally or, or really what the impact was of him actually moving. You know, um, you have to take into account, you know, Article 8, you know, right to private and family life. And 
the point was is that he's very close to some members of his family who were local to where he was in his current hospital and he would see his family more than once a week and by him moving 120 miles away that made it really difficult for them him to then have contact with his family which is super important and um, also on top of that it's the impact on a person's diagnosis so he has a personality disorder and he's also autistic and so for him things like routine things like change really difficult to handle and whether there's a massive need for it really had to be taken into account um and so we also pushed about the idea of irrationality was it really necessary to have to move him you know with such little notice such little planning to somewhere that was inadequate and it, there just simply wasn't so I'm really pleased that we were successful in this case. We stopped the move. He was successful from our side, but also from the tribunal side. Um, and we're now currently seeking costs against the trust for us having to make that application based on the fact that we were successful. So that is something um, that you can do. And it's just kind of an example, really, of how you can use judicial review for somebody who's an impatient, even though it may not always seem like it's the um, most obvious answer. So it's always worth exploring. The next option, um, really the legal option I want to just touch upon is the court of protection. And um, the court of protection protection will only apply if a person lacks capacity to make decisions to make the relevant decisions um, and this is this is really important so it has to be um, and it sorry it can be either health and welfare decisions or property and financial affair decisions so the sphere that I work in um, only deals with health and welfare decisions so that's kind of where my more knowledge base is but certainly I have colleagues who deal with property and financial affairs but I think in relation to those in inpatients it's really the health and welfare side that you would be considering. So the Court of Protection applies the rules that are laid out in the Mental Capacity Act and it can relate to um, any decision whatsoever. So it could be where the person lives, the care that they receive, but also anything. So it could be who they have contact with, it could be their use of social media, it could be who they can marry or if they have capacity to marry. And so the court protection can really deal with all of these issues. Um, within any application, um, declarations can be sought or challenged in respect of both capacity and best interest. So if a person has had a capacity assessment undertaken, which you don't think is valid or which contains information which is wrong, or actually doesn't cover the relevant information which would need to be known by the person for that specific decision, that could be challenged. And if there isn't an issue about capacity, but there is about best interests, then that can also be challenged. So the way a best interest decision is made um, is set out in section four of the Mental Capacity Act, and really that needs to be followed to the letter. So I think one thing that really must be thought about when you think about court protection is that the person who lacks capacity or potentially lacks capacity should always be at the centre of all decision making. There shouldn't be this kind of, you know, a disregard of wishes and feelings, even if the person is repetitive, even if the person, you know, appears to be saying things which don't make um, as much sense to a person who may well be listening to them. They really need to be thought about. And if, if they've made any prior wishes and feelings, certainly that needs to kind of come into the application. Um, legal aid, it can be available for these applications as well. And it's really dependent on the application being made. Um, again, you'll need to instruct a specialist lawyer with the correct legal aid contract if you want to explore or take advantage of, um, of this. Um, some lawyers are also now accredited legal representatives. So like myself, uh, we've undertaken additional training and got additional expertise to act directly on behalf of those who may lack capacity to conduct the proceedings themselves. So we can almost stand in the shoes of the official solicitor, um, albeit that we also, and I certainly do also um, instruct the official solicitor on more complicated cases, if things are more straightforward, 
the courts are more than happy for accredited legal representatives to um, explore those cases. What I've done here is I've just gone through a couple of examples, uh, again, of court of protection cases, which may well relate to a person in an inpatient setting. So firstly, P is subject to a standard authorization in a hospital or a unit and is unhappy and wishes to challenge this. The standard authorization is a legal process authorizing the deprivation of liberty of a person who lacks capacity to make decisions about care and is subject to continuous supervision and control in the CQC registered placement. It's really important that um, all of those factors fall into place in order for it to then become what's known as Section 21A application. And when I've referred to sections here, that means sections of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, if you're in this scenario, um, you're covered by non-means-tested legal aid. So as long as the standard authorization remains in place, you can apply for, um, or the sister on your behalf can apply for legal aid, which makes no difference what your means are um, in order for you to challenge that authorization. Um, the second scenario is that the person is in hospital, and this could be under the Mental Health Act, but is going to be discharged into a non-CQC registered placement. So this could be an independent supported living placement, um, for example, but that they will be deprived of their liberty once they're in that placement. So it may well be that they have, um, for example, three to one care at all times. You know, they may well need continuous supervision both within the setting and also whilst they're out and about in the community. And in this scenario, the Court of Protection will need to step in to authorise that legal deprivation of liberty. And what the court is authorising is the care plan which will be drawn up by um, the local authority usually um, and about looking at the care that will be provided and looking to ensure that it is the least restrictive option to meet the assessed needs of that individual. And again, if there are concerns around that, then um, a challenge can be brought regardless of who actually brings the original application. So typically the local authority will make the application, which is section 16 application to authorise this legal declaration of liberty. But if there are concerns the other way, then certainly this can be challenged. Um, this is subject to means tested legal aid, which does make things sometimes a bit more tricky because I know that some of these individuals who've been in hospital an awful long time, they've collated a lot of money because they've not been able to get out and about and be able to use it. And there are different options around this and certainly, you know, do speak to solicitors about the best ways to, um, to manage this situation if you have concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, the third option is that the person is in a non-CQC registered placement and is subject to an authorization of the court, which is what I just um, touched upon there. That's actually reviewed on an annual basis um, but the person then wishes to challenge the authorization or an element of the restriction. So it may well be that, for example, they um, moved into their placement and were happy initially, but then the care arrangements changed, the care plan changed, um, which would also need a return back to court. Um, but then they decide that actually they don't like the restrictions placed upon them or there's something about it which makes them particularly unhappy. And again, this can be brought as a section 16 application. So um, to challenge either that element of it, or if there's an additional restriction put in place around other issues such as contact, or if they start a new relationship and there's issues around um, sexual relations or um, marriage, that sort of thing, which may well not have been at the forefront of everyone's mind at the time when the original application was made. A further one can be made and again, that, that is means tested um, legal aid. So that just kind of shows some of the um, examples there of how that might well be applied, just to give a bit of a flavor. Um, so what I also just wanted to touch upon was the 
interface between the Mental Health Act and Mental Capacity Act, because what we're talking about really when we were looking at the call to protection there is about that crossover. And it is very much, you know, a, a lot of the work that I undertake does have that crossover within it. I think it's been a real debating point and a long-standing issue which has been considered about this crossover between the mental health tribunal sphere and within the court of protection and how you kind of get around that issue. Um, so what I've done is I've just pulled out just a few examples. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, there are many other examples. But I just kind of wanted to highlight the variety of cases that may well sort of crop up, which, which points to this mix and this interface, I think, between the two, um, the two areas. Um, so the GJ case um, was the first one to put on there. I'll, obviously, I'll put all the links up as well so that if you want to um, read about them, do. Um, I know that there's some really good newsletters like the 39 Essex newsletter, which gives super good summaries of um, all cases and gives like, um, um, I think it's like a monthly or bi-monthly newsletter with like all new cases coming up definitely recommend um, signing up to those if you haven't. But the, um, the GJ case um, concluded that if the Mental Health Act could be used, then it should be used. And that the Mental Health Act trumped the Mental Capacity Act. So for example, in that case, if a person who lacked capacity needed treatment in hospital for a mental disorder, and they were not in agreement with that, then treatment should be given under the Mental Health Act rather than under the Dole scheme under the Mental Capacity Act. So that was kind of the you know, initial kind of thoughts around that one. Then you looked at the, um, I looked at the RE-E case, which is looking at emergency life sustaining treatment of a person with anorexia nervosa. In that case, the Court of Protection made an interim order which allowed um, E, and he's the lady in the subject of this proceedings, to be deprived of her liberty until the Mental Health Act detention application could be made. So that was a way of kind of using both of them, um, although not at the same time. Um, also put down there the um, AM case. So this one considered um, a person who was being detained under Section 2 of the Mental Health Act. Um, an application was made to the Mental Health Tribunal for AM to be discharged from her section. It, was, it wasn't disputed in that case that um, she lacked capacity to make decisions about her care package and treatment. And it was argued on her behalf that she um, should be assessed and treated under the Mental Capacity Act. And that if she was deprived of her liberty, this could be authorised under the Dole's regime rather than needing to use the Mental Health Act. So in this case, um, Charles Jay considered that for decision makers having to determine whether the Mental Health Act or the Mental Capacity Act should be used, um, where a person requires assessment or treatment as an inpatient in a psychiatric hospital, there were really three questions to consider. So. The first one was, um, does the person have capacity to consent as an informal patient? Um, the second one was, might the clinical team be able to rely on the provisions of the Mental Capacity Act to lawfully assess or treat the person? And the third one was, if there is a choice between the reliance on the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act, which is the least restrictive way of achieving the proposed treatment or assessment? So following this decision, even for those individuals who may come within the scope of the Mental Health Act, the Mental Health Act then no longer had primacy and the Dole's regime remained as an alternative to be, to be taken into account and that should be considered. So this is what is, this was reflected in the Code of Practice 2015, um, which um, you may or may not have um, come across. And... Um, and really states that the choice of regime must be based on which is the least restrictive in the circumstances rather than a preference or familiarity. So if capacity is likely to be regained or fluctuating, this needs to be taken into consideration. 
And I think really the key point to take from this case is that decision makers should aim to find the least restrictive way of achieving the desired objective. And that's certainly something that I think people really need to bear in mind. Um, and then finally, um, I've touched upon the cases of MM and PJ, which were um, heard together, and a bit more recently on that one. Um, it looks over, it looks at the crossover of the use of dolls alongside a community treatment order in the case of PJ um, and a conditional discharge in the case of MM. Uh, where the person, so it looks at where a person may be discharged from hospital into a care regime which would amount to a deprivation of that person's liberty. And it's important to say as well that in that case, both individuals had capacity to consent to their care arrangements. The judgment in that case, which I'm not going to go over, um, but um, it, it's quite interesting and um, definitely worth a read. And I think the judgment in that case means that restricted patients, so like MM, with capacity cannot be lawfully discharged from hospital if the necessary care arrangements satisfy what we term as the Cheshire West acid test. So whether they would be deprived of liberty. And it also showed the responsible clinicians, so the um, doctors in charge of a person's care under the Mental Health Act, um, would have an implied power to deprive liberty under community treatment orders. However, the tribunal can't do that. So the responsible clinician can, but the tribunal can't. I think really both of these conclusions have been quite contentious and there's definitely further fallout. And I know that I come across this issue sometimes with a person who is potentially under both conditional discharge and adult and how they manage the situation with having to try and get a person out of hospital into the community, which on the face of it might be less restrictive, but also more restrictive in terms of the care they might well receive. And I think this definitely needs further consideration. Um, and there's there's other cases that you can have a look at which would follow up this issue. And certainly if you have any, you know, um, any of these particular issues, definitely worth getting advice on them just to make sure that the right regimes are always being followed. So I'm just going to move on to the final section, which is Human Rights Act claims. And um, this is another option for people who are in inpatient settings. And this can be used, um, and Human Rights Act claims can be made wherever public officials interact with people. So they have a legal um, duty to respect and protect human rights. These claims will often overlap um, with other cases that I've got within, for example, the Court of Protection. And you'll often see that when you get um, copies of care home records, it may well be that a person has been restrained um, for either long, long periods of time or in the incorrect way, or there might be um, things which are done which are against a person's care plan. And it's only when you really start to get this evidence within other applications that it may well become apparent this is actually happening and the extent to which it's happening. Um, so if you can prove there was negligence on the part of the um, NHS, for example, then um, a county court application could be made for damages. Um, and what you, what I would say about these is that you really should try and resolve the issues through the complaints procedure or through the Ombudsman first. And there are mixed successes um, that I know of through um, Human Rights Act claims. You do sometimes only receive nominal damages. And I think one thing I would say is that the Ombudsman and the powers of the Ombudsman are um, not to be um minimize so they can actually um award damages and um can be really successful and actually sometimes you can get the same or if not more damages within that kind of um application through um, a complaints procedure an ombudsman than you can through an actual human rights act claim um i've just outlined here some of the um, sections which might well be applicable and might well be consideration for breaches of human rights. So just to kind of bear in mind these sorts of issues. So um, Article 3 is a really important, well, obviously they're all really important, but um, is an important one, I think, particularly for people in inpatient settings. And I think this is one of the ones that 
um, we've really been thinking about in light of the issues around Walton Hall, Winterbourne View, yew, yew trees, and I think it just goes on, the right not to be tortured or treated in an inhumane or degrading way. I mean, absolutely shouldn't be happening. And if there are instances of that, then please do bring it to someone's attention and get some advice around that. Um, it does include things like um, inappropriate use of seclusion, um, physical or verbal abuse, just to kind of give examples of where that might be happening. Um, Article 8, right to respect for family life. Uh, this includes visiting uh, or restrictions. So I know some people are hundreds of miles away from their families. I know there's a massive issue right now with the um, COVID-19 restrictions on visiting. And again, um, if anybody needs the um, slides from my talk last week about uh, leave restrictions that I did with um, Oliver Lewis, then do let me know. And I can send those across. Um, it contains all of the law within that in relation to those sorts of challenges, but it certainly brings out the, um, the Article 8 points. I also put down there Article 14, right to be free from discrimination, um, Article 5, right to liberty, and Article 6, right to a fair trial. Um, the period of time of the breach um, of the human rights is not necessarily a determinative factor. And really what you need to look at is the individual situation. So, for example, there was a case in 2018 for damages for unlawful psychiatric detention. Um, and this person was, um, so they brought a claim on behalf of a person, um, PB, and um, they actually accepted an offer of um, 11 and a half thousand pounds in damages plus legal costs because of a breach of Article 5. So in that case, the patient had been detained under Section 5.2 um, when not an inpatient at all. And this section um, had lapsed for nearly seven hours before the Section 2 had begun. So even though they were, they were unlawfully detained for what some might consider to be a fairly short period, the fact is they were unlawfully detained at all. And that's the real crux of it. There doesn't necessarily need to be a minimum time period for that and the fact is is that the um the consideration needs to be given as the fact there was a breach rather than um anything else and i think it then kind of then goes on to the next situation of well you need to look at kind of what happened during that what the restrictions were what it breached and in what ways and i think that's what's really important so if you have any scenarios where you're not quite sure it's a borderline do kind of you know do ask those questions do seek um advice around that because it may well be that there's potentially claiming that. I mean, £11,500 certainly um, is a significant amount, um, albeit it doesn't necessarily make it right that that happened. Um, and um, so I mean, it shouldn't have happened at all in the first place, obviously. Um, the issue of seclusion and restraint policies also could be considered in the context of judicial review as well as Human Rights Act claims. So again, if you're not sure, always best to um, get some advice around that. Um, and um, again, you would need to be seeking somebody with the right legal aid contract if you're going to be looking for legal aid under this. Um, and you're looking for a public law contract if you want to be considering these kind of issues. In terms of predictions for the future, I think that personally, um, I think there's going to be a continued rise um, in these cases. I mean, I've obviously just gone through some of the options in a fairly kind of whistle stop tour way. Um, but I hope that what it does give is a flavour of the type of legal challenges which could be explored for somebody in these units. Um, I think that through the um, impact of social media, I think we're going to see further increases in cases. The fallout, the reaction to reports and cases, I think is felt so much quicker when individuals take to social media. You know, um, for example, when the CQC report came out last week, within kind of, you know, an hour, there was my, my Twitter feed certainly was flooded with people kind of reacting to it. And it's that very instant um, sort of feedback and people can then sort of react onto that and share it. And it can really get to like a wider audience. Um, I think there's gonna be more um, 
uh, they move as well towards these cross jurisdictional cases where you're considering not only the use of the Mental Health Act, but then bringing in um, COP cases and really trying to push COP cases, um, cause protection through these individuals in inpatient settings. One thing I'm also really doing at the moment is interacting quite a lot with care providers. I find this really helpful because then I can actually help to push forward for assessments. I can be approaching care providers and asking them if they're willing to consider these complicated um, people who perhaps have become institutionalised because they've been in the hospital so long and they're not necessarily um, going to have the easiest care package to put together. But I think what it really takes is somebody to really take the reins and to um, cut across all of these issues and pull everybody together. There are so many agencies in these particular kinds of cases that you really need to have a good grasp on what's going on at all stages and not just rely on the fact that somebody said that they've told somebody else something. You know, I think you really need to kind of track them through and to really, you know, this is the way that I found has been more successful um, in this. I think also the impact of COVID um, is continuing and the concerns for loved ones in units when they can't be seen is really going to ramp up some of the concerns of parents, carers and advocates. And I think whether this means challenges to leave restrictions themselves um, or additional problems such as delays to discharge, um, issues with changes, routines, um, changes in tiers um, between different tiers. I know in, in Newcastle, uh, where I am, we're currently in tier two. Um, so, um, but I know, or hopefully most of the country is um, still in tier one, although and obviously some are um, moving very swiftly into tier three. And I think this is really gonna add a number of additional cases on top of those challenges, which would already exist. I think units and, um, care providers sometimes jump very quickly on this change in tier and will just then shut down immediately. And this is kind of one of the issues that we need to cut through is actually what's the guidance, what's the law, what needs to be done and making sure that, that this is what we're doing for our um, clients. And I think on top of that, there's the extended media coverage. So next year we are approaching the 10 year, would you believe it, anniversary of the first broadcast of BBC Panorama's Walton Hall programme. And the continued work um, also to hold the government to account for not adhering to the previously set out time scale. Autistic and all got learning disabilities out of assessment and treatment unit. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and then more recently, obviously, is the fallout from the report. Re released um, last week, it was actually um, from the CQC. So I've put a link on there as well to, um, to the page, which has copies of not only the report, um, but also summaries and also e easy read versions. So there's different um, versions on that website, which I think is helpful um, for different individuals. Um, so this review really focused on services that provide care for people with learning disabilities and challenging behaviors. The inspectors carried out 150 unannounced inspections that looked at two national standards, which were um, care and welfare and safeguarding. And of the units that they actually inspected, um, 69, 69 failed to meet one or both of the standards. And only 35, yes, you've heard me right, 35 met both of the um, required standards. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily going to come as much of a surprise to people, um, you know, like us who work within this field. I think it, what it does show, and I think what we will be doing, is really keeping, you know, our ear to the ground and finding out now what's going to happen as a consequence of this. I think a lot of the campaign groups and individuals have been shouting about this and have been saying, "This is, this is what the reality is," and I think we're all hopeful I mean I don't know how successful we're going to be but all hopeful that because of this report things might start to change and I think it just hopefully will um will add on to that um I know that um there are a lot of questions being asked of the CQC and um and I really do hope that that sort of continues you know people need to carry on challenging that they need to um just see, I think, what happens now as a consequence of that report. 
really. Um, so what I've done, um, I've put um, I've put my email address down there so that if anybody um, wants to um, ask questions after the session, then by all means, um, there's my email address. Um, and also I put my Twitter on there. Like I said, I am very active on Twitter. Um, I do tweet a lot about um, these kind of issues, um, but also I don't just tweet about work. So um, do bear that in mind if you decide to follow me. Um, I do um, I do have personal knowledge of um, these kind of um, individuals because my little boy's got special needs. So I do tweet a lot about him as well. Um, but also, um, so if anybody has you know um, the same values as me and wants to follow me then by all means do that um but um yeah so that's the end of um my presentation so if anybody has questions um do shout up i will try and figure out how to exit out of this so that i can there's millions of questions oh my goodness is there <laughs> i don't know where to okay <laughs> right and... okay i'll do an easy one um what constitutes irrationality in a legal argument? So you mentioned before about um, sort of being irrational, and I think a couple of advocates aren't familiar with this idea. Is it to do with the Human Rights Act? And I don't know if it's what it's being reasonable or unreasonable. Yeah, I think I, I, I think if it's I think if you're looking at irrationality, what you're looking at really um, is whether a decision was made without any proper basis. So I think um, I think in, in the scenario that I gave there with um, Mr. X, what we were really considering was whether the decision made at that exact moment was really a rational decision, whether it was logical, whether it was based on anything at all, or whether it was completely ridiculous. Um, and you know, there was I think in his scenario, just to kind of help to um, illuminate that, so there wasn't actually anything leading up to it there was no there was no incident there was no mm -hmm. um there was no particular behaviors there was no concerns there was no increase in anything there was no changes to anything he literally just got told um that day that, that was happening and that was it so i think for us what we tried to show is that it was irrational because the trust had made a decision without any like basis really um i think is the um is the easiest way to sort of describe that does that help yeah, yeah thank you um and then question around is there a tension is there a risk between article 8 rights and then places which kind of ban or um reduce access to section 17 leave so they might have a policy about you know about risk reduction is is there a conflict there um i think the thing with section 17 leave um is that it's um, it's looked after and controlled um, and what well, I've seen by the responsible clinician. And I think there are um, there are things which need to be taken into account. I think risk factors are definitely one of them. I think if you have an individual where risk might be a problem, there might be ways around it. So if you can suggest things um, such as um, risk might be reduced if certain staff members take them out. So they may well be able to go down from a two to one to a one to one if they can do that. Um, I think, or if family members can take a person out and they can show that the risks um, aren't as such, then that might be helpful. And I think it's about kind of interacting and um, communicating with the responsible clinicians and the decision makers, um, or if they're on a forensic section, obviously the Ministry of Justice, about talking about leave and just trying to understand what it is that the risk problems are and how that can then be overcome. Mm. Um, and there's kind a sense of how, you, how you get around it. Sorry, I think there's a sense from some of the advocates that they get, um, I don't know if you can connect with this and give any advice, but they get tired. Um, I know Michael you used, used the word exhausted of constantly challenging these decisions and blanket bans. Do you feel like that at mm. all? Any, any advice? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the minute that um, COVID hit, I think everyone just went into complete kind of, you know, um, freak out and, you know, it just completely, you know, everyone was just like, that's it, quick shut everything down, you know, and I think, I, th I think it is exhausting having to go through and, you know, keep challenging after challenging, but I think, I think you have to do it, you know, you just have to kind of just go through it. And I think 
what what I'm trying to develop at the moment as well is like a precedent letter that um, that people can use for um, different things. And I know that part of Mm. our um, the toolkit guidance has some precedent letters that can be used. You could use that as a basis. Um, I think what I had to do, and I'm sure other people are as well, is about going through my entire case list. And I rang up every single care home, every single unit, every single, you know, everyone just to check kind of what they're doing. And you have to really keep on top of it. And it can be exhausting and it can be difficult. Um, But I think at the end of the day, what they should be doing is being held account. And I think if the regulations are out there and they're available, Mm -hmm. then units have to be reminded that this is what they have to be sticking to. And so the more that we can do that, hopefully it'll help also that person but also than other people yes and I think particularly for autistic people and people with a learning disability there were extra guidance wasn't there were kind of extra mm-hmm. recognition that that group um could, should be exempted from perhaps the normal restrictions and things like visiting yes. I think with the government they they took a few weeks to amend the guidance didn't they but they did that mm-hmm. they they said that should be a consideration um, yeah yeah, right. there, there, there was some um, additional guidance in May and then there was also some additional yeah. guidance put out in October as well and, and that I, I, Oliver and I both covered that in our um, webinar last week actually about mm-hmm. those things so again if anybody needs those slides or anything then just you know let me know. Thank you I think we might just send them around anyway um, whether, you, <laughs> whether you want them or not guys get them okay. <laughs> uh, right a te- techie one specific one um, if a person's out of area on a dolls and they're happy they're not objecting um, but the plan is to move them back into an area and they don't want to go, so they would be objecting. Um, the person's asked, should should we challenge that through the Dolls Appeal or a Section 16? So if they're not objecting? They're not objecting to the current placement, but they don't want to be moved, but the plan is for them to be moved in, back into area. So if they would still be a, if they would still be under a dolls and a standard authorization on a new placement, mm. I think you could, you could. Hmm, that's tricky one, isn't it? Because. Hmm. You've broken your question, isn't it? <laughs> You've broken. I know. Well, I'm. I'm <laughs> well, I'm trying to think because really. Section 21A should only be used if you're objecting, but you wouldn't strictly be objecting until you actually got to the new placement. So I suppose it'd be but, the new dolls authorization, isn't it? So, and, and I know, and Gray Menderby mm. used to be um, a right bugger for this, and he always used to make me laugh. He, what he would do is he would say to the uh, local authority, um, when they use the argument of care home B is more expensive than care home A, and the person wanted to go to care home B, he'd say to them, look, if you go for care home A, we will have to take it to the court of protection. It will have to go to a section 21A appeal because the person doesn't want to go there. On average, they cost about 10 to 15,000 pounds that the local authority is going to pay for. Mm -hmm. How many weeks at care home B would that money cover? And then we wouldn't object because the person would be happy and they'd be happy. And he'd often win those arguments on money um, and almost saying to local authority look do this to avoid you know before we said about cost of protection is often used to threaten people in the last session we said it it feels like you either agree to this care plan or we're going to take to the cost of protection I suppose this is where you need to be threatening the cost of protection on grounds and costs you know do this so we don't have to go to the cost of protection Um, I think it's a really clever and it was Graham who, who used to do that all the time um okay yeah. um, I was gonna say I think I think maybe what I would do is raise the concerns directly with the local authority they may well issue proceedings as section 16 and then the minute that P got added into the proceedings you could then reconstitute it with 21A because you'd be challenging the new the new standard authorization which would be in place yeah before you could be you doing it that way because you're not suggesting that it's not in the person's best interest to have that new care package I guess but um yeah mm. Mm, great yeah um okay and then a huge conversation going alongside your talk around and i don't expect you to solve this one today but recognition that the kind of mental health system is broken and it's not um it's causing more trauma for many people than it's actually helping and i think if i was to find a specific question in the conversation it was it was about is it possible to kind of judicially review 
organisations like NHS England or NICE who kind of approve these treatment programmes that aren't working for people? I hope I've done the conversation justice in that question, but I think that that was kind of, if you had any thoughts on that. I mean, so you can judicial review any body which acts as a public body. So in theory, yeah, I mean, one other thing you could do is judicial review um, a care provider. So because a care provider acts as a public body, that would also be a way to do it. So you could, you could in theory, um, challenge a care provider for setting up a service so you know we all know one particular care provider <laughs> who I'm sure everybody would be interested in um JRing and um so I think that would um that could in theory um be an option as well is about um commissioning the actual service and opening or recommissioning services which might well have been shut down that might be something as well which mm. um I think certainly um I think a lot of us are looking at mm um and certainly looking into so if you have anybody who you think might well fall into that kind of category then that's yeah. something which could definitely and I be guess that, yeah you know that that's what the course of protection is there for if there's a disagreement on where somebody should live then we should be seeking that route out shouldn't we hmm. yeah I think um definitely and I think um I think quite a lot of these individuals in assessment and treatment units they're under the mental health act and I think the restrictions on um, legal aid from mental health solicitor um, mm. are quite narrow. So the minute they get a decision from the tribunal, for example, their legal aid will end. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the situation ends for that person. I think it's mm. about then trying to collaborate alongside um, somebody else, like a community care lawyer or um, someone like myself, who can then sort of like take that mantle on and then keep it going and then move it into the court of protection as and when appropriate and to make those additional kind of Queries and things. Um, we were talking earlier. Hopefully, we... that's. I was thinking about our conversation earlier, Kirsty, just to share it with the, with the wider group about um, advocates connecting more to the Mental Health Act solicitor. And you know, if you are an IMHA, making sure that that solicitor is aware of, of concerns that you might be having and talking to them about these kind of routes um, to see if if they can they they can help. Um, and just on JR, uh, like, I've just seen a late question come in. Yeah, because you said JR should kind of be used as a last resort, generally speaking, um, should people try the ombudsman first? What Any thoughts or guidance on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, th I think the ombudsman actually is, a, is an underrated um, service. I think a lot of people kind of see it. them quite heavily, um, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, well, no, they have, they have. And I think, um, I think, I mean, it's really welcome what they're doing. Um, I think a lot of people could kind of see it as just like a way just to, you know, um, like, or complain, it's going to take forever, and you're going to get nowhere. But actually, the Ombudsman is really um, coming into their own and um, has really wide reaching powers. And I know that they had paused all of the new claims, they've mm -hmm. now restarted them um, kind of a few months ago now. So um, certainly, they're welcoming, you know, new issues and things. And yeah, they can, they, they can make you know, um, damages um, claims, they can um, make recommendations, they can, they've really got quite good powers, actually. Um, so I think if you're considering certain issues, I think that's definitely one of the routes. And it's also, it's free, um, you know, to make that yourself and to do it yourself. Um, and there's, there's, there's no cost implication for doing that. Mm. One thing you can't do is do it alongside a JR. So if you did that, start to Oh, gosh, she disappeared. I think she's gonna. Oh, you're back. And you're mute, Kirsty. You're mute. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I was just saying, if you started on an ombudsman route and then decide you want to go along the judicial review route, the ombudsman would actually stop and pause their work whilst right. you continue with the JR. So you oh. can't necessarily do them alongside each other. But if there's issues around even like community care, um you know care apps things like that you know you can you can follow through the ombudsman um and they will explore all of those issues um so they are really actually super helpful i found yeah that's what i didn't realize you couldn't do both at the same time mm. cool great thank you um right i'm conscious that we've run over by 10 minutes but there were, there were, there were questions around um, no no it's just amazing thank you um <laughs> 
we could talk all day. But yeah, it seems to us that the, the kind of one of the biggest barriers, I know you've touched upon this, is guesting placements and homes. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word placement. I don't like that word, but homes in the community mm. and getting the right providers. And that's the sticking point. Um, lots of people saying that, you know, people are ready for discharge, but there's no nowhere for them to live. So you have this ridiculous scenario, don't you, where they have to stay in hospital despite not needing any care and treatment, but there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, so, yeah, I know you you talked there around in the importance of getting relationships with care providers, but do you think advocates should be kind of stepping into that space too? I mean, yeah, absolutely. If, if, if they can, um, I, think it's, I think it's really worthwhile. I think I've definitely unstuck um, some really complicated individuals um by doing that and also just by attending meetings by like you know if if someone makes an action point and they said they're going to do something or they're going to send information to somebody else you know because of all the agencies there's so many involved isn't there in each of these cases mm. you know um you really need to kind of hold someone to account and then just move on and keep kind of just pushing and plugging forward because the minute you stop they're going to also stop and um and that's what i found and i, I don't think i don't know if it's necessarily a resource issue or you know, or what have you, but I think, um, I think, you know, some of these people are very complicated and just need you to kind of really just keep pushing through. And that's, and that's kind of what I've had um, success with. Um, and then, and then take it to the court of protection at the right time. So once you've identified that you're going to be a non-CQC placement, um, then you can then apply, you know, you can ask the local authority to make the application to the, um, to the court of protection or make it yourself um, and then kind of move that on and then get the court to, um continue on and badger everyone else that's so mm. quite helpful mm. yeah yeah right i think we could probably go on forever so i'm going to call it there and um, because we, we've gone a little bit over our hour um so huge thanks to, to kirsty of course and her, her wonderful talk that i think has given people lots of food for thought i can see in the chat box um, and then thanks to you guys for, for being part of this session and creating some energy around this and Hopefully, you'll be able to use some of this information to, to really get and um, get stuck in and help people get get out of these uh, institutions. There was a MenCap; they do a, an infographic, don't they, Kirsty, every year for transforming care, and uh, it came out last week. And I think it, it's over six hundred people already have been ready for discharge for months. So these are people who do not need to be locked up; they are ready for homes in the community, but there aren't any, so they they are languishing. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, yeah. So let's go do we'll it. Get there.